All right, uh, I wanted to talk about the, the vaccine. Um, so as you know, Pfizer came out, uh, was it now, uh, uh, over a week ago, and said that, um, that they have a vaccine that's 90% effective. I mean, 90% effective is off the charts. I mean, nobody, nobody, nobody expected that a vaccine would have 90% effectiveness. And, uh, you know, Pfizer came out and, and announced it, and it was a huge deal. Um, so a few things that I found interesting in the story about the vaccine. Uh, uh, first of all, I, the first thing to note about the vaccine is, um, thank you, Thomas, is how fast it was produced. I mean, wow. It's, it's, it's what, seven months uh, that is a, a world record for vaccine development. Vaccines in the past have taken decades, years, if not decades. Uh, vaccine uh, production of, 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 of finding an effective vaccine is very, very, very difficult. And I think this is a, a dramatic indication of how far biotech has advanced and how, how, far, um, how far the science uh, has advanced and a real a real testament to the human mind and uh, to the private sector and to biotech companies and the pharma industry. We'll talk a little bit about pharma and biotech in a minute, but uh, a real testament to to the science and the advancements and the understanding that we have now of how uh, viruses work and and how the human immune system works um, and uh, and and you know so terrific, terrific, amazing. Achievements, we should uh, we should definitely be celebrating this. We should definitely be, uh, you know, uh, 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 celebrating the, the achievement that uh, that this is uh, that this is produced. Uh, you know, uh, OMG writes that there seems to be two types of rapid prototype vaccines. One is mRNA. mRNA is is a it's a, the Pfizer vaccine. You know, it's an immunotherapy. It's uh, and the other one is adenovirus and spike protein, uh, which is a different technology that University of Oxford and, uh, and other U.S. vaccine makers uh, are using that. Uh, I'm not sure the, the, Moderna, the Moderna one, uh, which one that is. I think it's also an mRNA. I think it's also an mRNA vaccine. But anyway, these are brand new technologies, state of the art, were not possible just a few years ago. A lot of it has to do with the understanding of the role of RNA, the role of our own immune system, which is constantly developing, constantly improving. It, it is truly stunning, truly stunning, uh, the advancements we've made and the ability of these biotech companies to do the work as fast as they did. Uh, so first, good for Pfizer, and, and I'm hoping uh, Moderna comes out next week with some, some pretty awesome results as well. That's what the rumors have that they'll announce maybe Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so that's, I, I want to make that, that's point number one. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was about um, who actually developed this vaccine. Because Pfizer's getting all the credit, but it really wasn't Pfizer. Pfizer is the company that got the vaccine through the FDA approval process. Pfizer is the company that will figure out the logistics of distribution. Uh, it, they will be the ones who market and distribute it. They have, they have the logistical expertise. They have the capacity to scale production, uh, so they will be responsible for producing the vaccine. Uh, but Pfizer did not do the science behind this vaccine. The science behind this vaccine was done by a, actually by a German company, by a company called... Bio, BioNTech, that's how you pronounce the name, B-I-O-N-T-E-C-K-C-H, BioNTech, BioNTech, uh, a company that was founded in Mainz in Germany in 2008, a company that does uh, really was focused on immunotherapeutic cancer drugs, so immunotherapy, again, is using our own immune system to fight cancer, that was, that was the basis on which, um, in, in which they did it. Uh, Pfizer did not take $300 million to develop the vaccine. Pfizer took the money from, uh, from uh, Warp Speed 
in order to manufacture and distribute. In, in other words, they took the money to sell the vaccine to the United States, to consumers in the United States, the U.S. government. It, not, not a single dollar, American dollar, went into the development of this vaccine. The development of this vaccine was funded by uh, this biotech company in Germany with, uh, with Pfizer. Pfizer got the money, basically they, they, they got the money for production and distribution uh, of the vaccine, not the actual science behind it. Um, what's fascinating about this company, and, I, and, and some of you really should block your ears now because this is gonna be very, very, very offensive to some people who typically listen to my show. So, uh, you know, I, I gave you a trigger warning. I, I've given you, you know, I've given you enough time to shut this down, to press stop, to plug your ears or whatever. Uh, but the, the Bi BioNTech is a company that was founded by a husband and wife duo, husband and wife duo, trigger warning now. Um, and then the, the, their names are Uga Sahin and Oslem Turechi. And uh, shockingly, and uh, you know, the impossibility of this is truly amazing. Sahin and Turechi are children of Turkish immigrants to Germany. Turkish immigrants to Germany. Oh my God, that, that is impossible. Turkish immigrants to Germany are Muslims and, and they're gonna turn, I mean, the, the only purpose of them immigrating to Germany is to turn Germany into part of the Caliphate. And yet here they are, here they are children of Turkish Muslim immigrants. Um, uh, you know, one of them, one of them, the father worked at a Ford factory, the other one, so a worker, manual worker, and the other one was actually a doctor, you know, the Turks, doctors. Um, and uh, here they are. Uh, so the husband is uh, the CEO, the wife, a woman, God, a woman, uh, is the chief medical officer. Um, they, this isn't the first biotech company they started. The first uh, biotech company they started was in 2001. It was called Gandimad Pharmaceuticals, and it was sold. It was sold in, uh, in 2016 for 1.3 billion euros. 1.3 billion euros. So these, this couple are probably billionaires. If not, they're worth many hundreds of millions. Um, and uh, it was sold to a, a Japanese uh, pharma company. Uh, in 2008, they founded Bio, BioNTech. So these people ran at two companies. <laughs> I mean, amazing, amazing entrepreneurs. Um, BioNTech is, is developing these cancer immunotherapies. They research centered on messenger RNA, mRNA. Uh, and it turns out that mRNA can be used for the development of, of, um, of uh, vaccines. Um, and when Corona hits. Now, they had been working with Pfizer on a flu vaccine. And when March hit, when, the, when Corona hit, they pivoted. And they agreed to work with Pfizer on applying the technology that they already had, applying the technology that they had worked with Pfizer on for the flu vaccine. They pivoted to working on a coronavirus vaccine. And, you know, they did it. They, they were the first ones. They were the first ones to actually develop this. Uh, you know, who many, uh, we, we won't know how many lives these people have saved, will have saved in Europe and the rest of the world. Um, you know, it, it, this is true breakthrough type technology. This is the first uh, vaccine developed with this kind of technology. As I said, Moderna is using a similar technology, mRNA technology as well. Moderna is an, is a, is an American biotech company. But this is truly amaz amazing. Now, just to be clear, Pfizer did, was not very involved in the science. Pfizer primarily took care of dealing with the FDA and, and dealing with European regulators and other regulators. So Pfizer managed the clinical trials. For that, you need infrastructure and you need a lot of money. Uh, and Pfizer is responsible for the clinical trials, by the way, in the US, and, uh, while the BioNTech conducted their own clinical trials in Germany. And Pfizer is, um, you know, is done all the, the like the late stage, the global late stage uh, uh, trials. And Pfizer is responsible for the manufacturing and distribution of this vaccine. We'll get to distribution in a minute because it is very difficult to distribute this. Uh, so we're talking about a, an interesting partnership. Now, one of the one of the 
issues about partnership, of this issue, one of the interesting uh, aspects of this is this is kind of typically what pharmaceutical companies in the United States have become because of regulations, because of constraints, because of the bad rap pharmaceutical companies get. The pharmaceutical companies do very little basic science anymore. What the pharmaceutical companies are really, really, really good at is FDA trials, going through the FDA process, manufacturing and distribution and marketing. That's what pharma is good at. And what they do is they let biotech companies do the science, and then they buy either the drugs or the company, the whole company, they buy it once uh, it, it is proved efficacious to some extent. And then once it is efficacious, they, uh, they take that drug uh, and they manufacture it and they distribute it and they do the marketing and they get it approved by the FDA and they, they do all the things that you need to do. So Big Pharma has become, I'm a big fan of Big Pharma, so don't take this as an insult, it's just a reality because of the way they're regulated. That what they become is primarily a regulatory marketing, manufacturing, distribution entities. They are no longer huge entities that are, have real power when it comes to the science. The science is done by small biotech, innovative biotech companies, and then the biotech company builds itself up to sell to pharma that then can leverage that and get them through the FDA and do all that kind of stuff. Right? Uh, I mean, hugely value-adding, you need somebody like that, and given the regulations that we have, you need somebody who can deal with the regulators, and that's what Big Pharma is, is doing. So uh, incredibly valuable. So I thought that was interesting, uh, you know, that the, and, and the story of these entrepreneurs is a terrific story. It's a story that, that, that I hope is told over and over and over again, um, and, uh, and that, that we kind of internalize. By the way, the CEO of Pfizer, the CEO of Pfizer, is a, is, a, is a guy named Dr. Albert Buller, uh, who, who is, uh, who is uh, you know, he seems like a good guy. And, and again, Pfizer's done a really good job getting these trials done and getting the FDA to prove, hopefully, to prove next week uh, the drug for distribution. But uh, Albert, and, and again, you might want to block, you know, yes, but Albert Buller is also an immigrant, uh, in this case to the United States and in this case from Greece. Um, so um, I don't know. I, you know, I heard these immigrants are useless. Uh, but, but at least some of them seem to be quite productive. Finally, one other thing about the Pfizer vaccine, and this is going to be true of Moderna, one of the problems with these, it looks like these mRNA vaccines, is that they're very, very um, unstable, let's call them. That is, the, the, the vaccine it, it requires that it be stored at extremely cold temperatures. Now, we're talking about minus 80 Celsius or minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit. I bet somewhere else it's 90-something degrees Fahrenheit. But anyway, really cold. The kind of cold that would kill you in five minutes if you went in, even if you were wearing, like, a snowsuit and everything. We, I mean, colder than it gets in Michigan. And that's cold because Michigan is really cold, as Jennifer will tell you. Really, really, this is Antarctica-like cold in the worst, in the worst time, right? Now, this is the problem. You got millions and millions of these, right? Because every human being is going to have to get two, two shots, right? So you got two doses for every human being. That's, let's say that's 700 million doses in the United States. Um, and then uh, globally, you've got billions of these. And... You've got to store this at minus 80 Celsius. You've got to, you've got to transport it in, in dry ice. As far as I know, there's just not enough dry ice available to do this. So think about now the logistics, the infrastructure that you have to build in order to be able to transport the vaccine. And, you know, Henry asks, is Operation Warp Speed going to start manufacturing? Now, imagine if the government had to do this. 
Now, you could argue maybe the, the, the U.S. Army, the military could do it, given that, you know, they deploy forces all over the world, they do this. But minus 80 degrees Celsius. How are you going to do this? Well, unsurprising to me, but maybe to some of you, it's not the government that's going to solve this problem. Although, uh, from what I hear, governments are running around trying to buy any refrigerator that can store stuff at that cold uh, around, and they're buying huge quantities of them. But, but no, this is not going to be sold by governments. Who's going to solve this? Well, UPS and DHL and FedEx. UPS is building two giant freezer farms capable of supercooling millions of vials of a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, there are going to be two facilities, at, at the beginning at least. One is in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky is, of course, a hub for UPS. They can ship everything out of there. And the other one is in the Netherlands, which is a big UPS hub, hub for Europe and the rest of the world. They're going to have 600 deep freezers. They can each hold 48,000 vials of vaccine at temperatures as low as minus 80 degrees Celsius. From there, they will load these vaccines up onto airplanes, trucks, and other delivery vehicles on dry ice. So they are, they, they've done this before because they ship medicines around the world anyway. But now they have to ramp up production of dry ice, production of containers that use dry ice to cool. All of this is happening. UPS, FedEx, DHL, in other words, the private sector is ramping up the production in order to do this mass distribution. And they expect to be airlifting thousands of tons of this kind of stuff all over the United States and all over Europe and all over the world, ultimately. I mean, I, I get a little teary-eyed, I have to say, because this, this stuff excites me. This stuff is cool. I mean, I know you guys probably want me to talk about the election and Biden and Trump. Who the F? I mean, this stuff is interesting, right? The creation of a vaccine, the science that goes into it, the, 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 the logistics of it, the... the all the, everything, the, the thinking, everything that has to go into this is so amazing. It's so exciting. And then the infrastructure and the ability of the private sector to adapt. And, and the f people say, oh, no, oh, no. The private sector short-term thinking. Really? I mean, UPS is building these farms way ahead of any government institution buying the, the refrigerators. Why? Because, no, it is the private sector that is long-term thinking. Long-term thinking. So to me, uh, this is amazing. Uh, leave it to the private sector. Keep the government away from this. Away, please, away, away. I mean, maybe if they fund it, it'll be relatively okay. But if they have to build it, if they have to transport it, if they have to... Dis no, stay away, government. It is truly a beautiful thing to watch the private sector rise up in an emergency to deal with an emergency. And if they've left... If they'd left COVID to the private sector, we wouldn't be where we are today. We'd be in much better shape. By the way, we probably would be already taking the vaccine. I'm eager to, take the, to get the vaccine. I know some of you don't like that, but I'm eager to get, take the vaccine. And, but, you know, we've known these results for a few weeks now. Why isn't it shipping already? Oh, it turns out the FDA has to convene. It has to evaluate the results. It then has to deliberate. It has to discuss. It has to accept opposition views. It, you know, so they will take about a month to grant emergency approval in an emergency. The private sector, when there's an emergency in the private sector, that means it's an emergency, which means, I mean, it's shocking, I know, but it means you do it fast. You act fast. You move quickly. That's what it means. Don't tell the government, but that's what it means. Limbeck, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that. Anyway, uh, to me, this is fascinating. By the way, every one of these freezers that uh, UPS is buying costs anywhere between ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars. You know, uh, so uh, these farms are costing millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars. These are ultra low temperature freezers, special freezers. 
10 to 15. So each one of these farms, freezer farms right now, is at a minimal cost of $6 million. That's just for the freezers. I'm not talking about the electricity, the wiring, the infra, all, everything else. That's private companies. Now, yes, the government is probably going to pay for the actual vaccine. But if not, the government insurance companies would do it, and we would have had it by now. Anyway, I think this is cool. This is much more exciting to me than the next topic we're going to move to. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at youronbrookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.